Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, we're back for the one o'clock block. This is Life in the Law. We're going to talk about law and lawyers, but more than that, we're going to talk with Brad Coates, a founder, if I can say, um, of Coates and Fry right here in the Pioneer Plaza. Thank you for coming on the show, Brad. Thanks for having me again, Jay. Yeah. So today's discussion, we have styled it as a new look at modern marriage and matrimonial law. This is very interesting and provocative, and nobody could be in a better spot you know, here in Honolulu as an expert, a professional, than you, because you wrote the book. The book is in front of us. The book is called mm, Divorce with Decency. Catchy, huh? Yeah, catchy. Well, you know, but if you look at the book, and we did talk about the book last time, it's more than just decency and divorce. It's decency in general, isn't it? That's the idea. <laughs> yeah. So we can talk about, we can talk about marriage and also matrimonial. Let's talk about marriage first. And let's talk about changes in marriage, modern marriage. The institution has changed, hasn't it? Well, the institution's totally changed. Uh, for one thing, it's declined dramatically. I mean, in the 1970s, 75% of everybody was married. According to the uh, 2012 sentence, sen census, whatever that is, um, the, uh, the, the, for the first time, the number of married adults in America had dropped below 50%. Really? Down to 48%. I remember there was, don't you agree there was a rash of divorces in the 70s, maybe into the 80s, when people were really not comfortable with being married, I guess? Everybody wanted a divorce, so they were all looking for liberty and freedom <laughs> and whatnot. Well, I, out of the 60s, everything sort of changed, and there was yeah. that, you know, that find yourself, you know, movement, and there was a huge period where people were, you know, trying to get you know in, in tune with their inner needs and being, and then so marriage did drop off dramatically in the 70s. It stabilized a little bit more in the 80s and 90s, mm. and uh, and now people, it's, uh, the problem is that the number of people getting married has declined. So really, marriage as an institution is, you know, possibly even on its way out. I mean, there are there are sociologists that predict that by 2040 there there'll be no more marriage left anywhere. In a lot of Scandinavian countries, there's there, there's far uh, far more unmarried people. Including unmarried people having kids and having domestic partnerships or whatever, but just not not actually married. Um, and in in America, that's it's headed that way too. Yeah, let's look at that from both ends. Why is this happening? I mean, one thing is you you have to live in at least a middle class economy to have the wherewithal, right, um, to to want that freedom. Uh, you know, because there were there have been economic consequences of being married and being single. You have to have a certain amount of resource to be single in, a, in, in our world today. But what other factors play into this uh, uh, you know, decrease in marriage? Well, you know, it's funny that you mentioned the, the economic aspect of it, because sociologically and economically, here's what's happening. College graduates are, getting, are still getting married. They're still staying married. People that have gotten in, not completed high school or just, just completed high school but stopping short of, of college, they're a lot of times just living in cohabitation uh, relationships, maybe having kids in those relationships, but stopping short of marriage. So now you've got what's called the paternity calendar. And it's a self-segregating element of society because marriage, marriage has been shown to be economically a good move for people. It's estimated that people that get married have twice the wealth accumulated over the course of their lives. And you can as file joint are returns on so many You can things. do all kinds of stuff, yeah. yeah. And uh, so it's, it's, it's good for society, generally viewed as being good for society. It's certainly good economically for the participants, but it's self-segregating now because the people that are, like I say, are less educated and are lower economic strata are less likely to get married, which means that they go in and out of relationships, raising kids, you know, in a non, you know, a non continuous kind to, of a situation. They're not to be affluent that way. That's right. That's right. And then the kids that come from those kind of homes are, are less likely to be as stable as, and, and have as good a shot as, as kids that come from helicopter parents that are both high educated married people. Yeah. So that's, that's the second part of my unpacking with you. So we have a country where, you know, the amount of marriage, um, the, demo, the, uh, the, the demograph on, on marriage declines. Um, and that's because of more economic considerations and also social considerations. But that has to have an effect on the country. Uh -huh. If I give you, you know, millions and hundreds of millions of people who are cohabiting instead of being married, that has to have an effect on the, on the economy. It has to have an effect on the, 
the social structure of our, of our lives and our country. A, a huge effect. I mean, right now, 40% of all the children in America are being born out of wedlock, which to people of yours and my generation is a shocking figure. For, for women under 30, 50% of all the kids are being born out of wedlock. Uh, it is, it's a huge, huge game changer because that, you know, again, now you're in a situation, that I've got nothing against cohabitation and it's a, you know, it's, it's a common way to, to keep relationships going, becoming more common all the time, but it's just not proven to be as stable. People who cohabit have a likelier chance of breaking up, they got a less chance of rearing children in a continuous fa fashion, so you've got a lot of kids being raised by single parents and there's social problems that are attended and to we that. We pay a price for that. We, the community, pays a price That's for correct. that. That's correct, yeah. yeah. The, so, the paternity calendar is the fastest rising calendar in, 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 oh, in domestic relations. Yeah. The divorce calendar is shrinking. The paternity calendar, was, which is the one for when you have kids out of wedlock, that's the fastest rising calendar on the, on the uh, court's calendar. And is the law changing in that? What I mean is, uh, can, can a woman who uh, has a child out of wedlock, out of marriage, um, can she be sure she's going to recover paternity uh, claims? Well, she's, you know, what's happened is, as far as custody goes is that there's a trend towards joint custody. In marriages, if you get divorced and you've got kids certainly over a certain age, the, you know, the courts are going to try and steer it towards joint physical as well as joint legal custody. And, you know, there's some of that on the paternity calendar, although maybe a little bit less so because, again, those relationships haven't been as long or as established. But you know, certainly parents, uh, males who spawn kids are going to be paying child support. They're going to get tracked down oftentimes by the, by the government, and they're going to pay child support. And then they've got custodial uh, and visitation rights, uh, you know, similar to what, uh, what you would have in a marriage, almost identical, mm -hmm. uh, or, or now, at the end of a marriage, I should say. And uh, that's, you know, that's an ongoing phenomenon. But generally, I think probably there's a, there's a higher rate of um, single moms taking custody of kids in paternity calendar than there is certainly in the in divorced moms taking sole custody. Yeah, and what about, what about dads? Uh, and I suppose a judge has to look at both parties and their lifestyle, their ability to manage these kids in order to determine a good joint custody arrangement. Because joint custody isn't always just half the time with one and half the time with the other, I, I guess. It's, it's more complex than that, isn't it? Well, it can be more complex than that. There's all kinds of different ways to structure it, but the court oftentimes will steer it towards, you know, literally half-half time. Mm. That's the, when they've done follow-up studies of the children of divorce 20, 30 years down the line, what the kids say, the, 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 diff, the most difficult part of their divorce, of their parents' divorce or separation, was losing contact with either parent. So the touchy-feely psychologists and child psychologists in California came up with joint custody as being the best way to minimize the effects of divorce on kids. So now they try and force, you know, the majority of people down the, down the joint custody track, which is tough. Joint physical custody can be very difficult for mm. parties to implement. Does it work? Well, it, it, uh, it has a lot of issues. I mean, like I say, it's, you know, if, if, in, if it's on the paternity calendar and a kid's come out of a one-night stand and, you know, the guy's paying child support and hasn't had much contact with the kid, it can be pretty difficult for the parties to put that back mm. in the box. If, you, if you've got a 15-year-old kid that's been the, the subject of a happy marriage, then it makes sense to have both parents have, have equal access to the kid. But what happens is in joint custody, as far as it affects the child custody calculation and the child support calculations, that it can cut your child support almost in half. So an awful lot of people are arguing for joint custody just because they don't want to pay full boat child support. Ah. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> you know, uh, we, we talked before about, um, you know, uh, uh, filing joint returns and having tax benefits and all that. Uh, is there something emerging in the law these days to allow cohabiting couples um, to have those kinds of benefits? Not that I'm aware of. I don't, I don't think so. I don't think just cohabitation allows you to file joint returns. It would certainly be handy, but there are certain areas where that's still the, the, the marriage demarcation is, is the bottom line for that yeah. kind of thing. And you said that, um, you know, in the years to come, we, we may not have marriage as an institution. Well, there is, there's a sociologist named, named Charles that? Martel who's predicted the end of marriage in a dramatic piece that he wrote uh, by 2035, 2040. So uh, it, that, would be, that would be pretty interesting if that happened. But, you know, you, you tend to think that if a couple is cohabiting and there isn't marriage in the formal sense, I mean, even now, religious marriages are probably declining in favor of civil marriages. I'm... I'm sure you see that, but um, you know what? What about the the notion of uh, filling in the gap? What about the Lee Marvin type of claim, uh, where you, you know you get alimony even even without a marriage? 
Well, that, that happens in some, they, they call that common law marriage, with if you, where if you've been together for a certain number of years, you're, you know, the law turns you into a married couple whether you really were or not, and gives property rights accordingly. Um, I'm told that in Canada, that can be a very short period of time. In a lot of jurisdictions, uh, it's, it's seven years. Um, but we don't not have- Not Hawaii, no. Not Hawaii, we have no common law. You can live with somebody for as long as you want in Hawaii, and, and there's still no joint property rights. No, that's not gonna change. But what does happen is that once you do get married, everything, and this is an important part of matrimonial law, it is viewed that, that, that there's a, a literally partnership principle of, of marital law now, so everything becomes half-half. Retirement plans, uh, it used to be guys would try and hide money in, in trusts or disinherit spouses in favor of their girlfriends or do what, you know. Now all of that gets plowed right through and it's half of everything you've got. And it's half of everything you've got until the date of actual divorce, which really fools a lot of people because a lot of people, you know, they, they separate they haven't got the energy or the money to hire an attorney, or they just, you know, just, you know, they just kind of let it go. You go your way, I go mine, and they forget to put a final end, you know, ending date to the marriage. And they come to me 20 years later and say, "Hey, my wife, you know, my she's still my wife. We haven't seen each other in 20 years. She wants half of my pension for the last 20 years. How fair is that?" And the answer is, the judge's hammer doesn't fall on property division until the date of actual divorce, not separation. Until all the appreciation. So you got to you got to get her done. <clears throat> this suggests that it's a better economic move for the the person who has the resources to cohabitate instead of getting married, doesn't it? Well, I'm sure that's probably true, although yeah. only a cynic such as yourself would suggest that, but yes, that, that is true. <laughs> what about uh, anti-nuptial agreements? Uh, we see a lot of that these yeah, days. Yeah, they're getting to be more common, especially, you know, especially people that have been to see the divorce lawyers like me a, a time or two before. They don't want to yeah. do it again, so yeah, they, yeah, they yeah. want a prenuptial, and, they, and the courts are generally enforcing those. Is it worth having an anti-nuptial agreement with a cohabitation? Well, I don't know if you can have a, you know, like I say, a pre like a child support. A premarital agree. You can't determine child support anyway. That's that. You can't, that's you can't all, agree. You can't agree. That's a, that's a policy point for you, the judge. You cannot in a in a premarital agreement or in, in any kind of agreement between the parties themselves. You cannot attempt to 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 predetermine who's going to get custody or what the child support is going to be. That's always within the sole purview yeah, of the court. That sounds right, actually. Yeah, yeah. So we we, we talked about uh, how marriage has changed and is changing and will change in the at least in the foreseeable future. We're going to take a short break, and then we'll come back, and I would like to talk about how matrimonial law is changing. You alluded to that a minute ago on, on the, the fall of the hammer issue. Yep. <laughs> this is Brad Coates, Coates and Fry. We'll be right back after this break to talk about changes, notable changes, changes you should write down. It'll be on the final exam, too, by the way, um, you know, in, in modern matrimonial law. We'll be right back. Hello, and welcome to Out of the Comfort Zone. I am your villainous host, R.B. Kelly. Today we are playing two truths and a lie, and I will tell you two truths, and you will tell me which one is the lie. Truth number one, this is a real mustache. Truth number two, I want you to watch my show on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. So tune in and let me know which is the truth and which is the lie. I'm R.B. Kelly with Out of the Comfort Zone, and show up next Tuesday to see my mustache live. Hi, I'm Bill Sharp, host of Asian Review here on Think Tech Hawaii. Join me every Monday afternoon from 5 to 5.30 Hawaii Standard Time for an insightful discussion of contemporary Asian affairs. There's so much to discuss, and the guests that we have are very, very well informed. Just think, we have the upcoming negotiation between uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un. The possibility of Xi Jinping, the leader of China, remaining in power forever. We'll see you then. Okay, it's Brad Coates and his book, <clears throat> which we've talked about before, is Divorce with Decency, but it goes further. It goes to marriage with decency, cohabitation with decency, Life with decency. Life with decency. <laughs> and it really is so important these days. <clears throat> so you were saying <clears throat> during the break that, we, that, we, that our society is changing at a rapid rate. No surprise, because everything around us is changing. So you have to expect the you know, social constructs of our society to be changing. So cohabitation is changing. And maybe the, you know, the, 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 form, the form of uh, relationships going forward. But what about marriage itself? Seems like when you get married these days, you know, the, uh, in, in the Jewish religion, it's called the chuppah. The chuppah is the little tent over you as, you as you break the glass and get married. 
it's different. But the relationship expected of you is different. When you utter the magic words, the promise somehow is different. This is governed by the law, isn't it? So how is it different? How is it changing right now? You've been doing this for a long time. How is it changing? Well, I, uh, I wrote a piece a while ago about, uh, that I just titled, I'll, I'll read it off. Seven mega trends of the new millennium. And I talked about the first being the women's movement and the rise of what they call the she economy, which is that women no longer need to rely on men economically. Now, now they're out earning guys about a third of the time and they, you know, they're, they rule the roost. Cohabitation, obviously a big one. Social media and the internet, something that you're all about. And that, you know, they say that a third of all relationships are, are starting up via the internet nowadays. Oh, yeah. And God only knows how many of them are ending via the internet yeah. because basically, you know, you got a lot of oops mistakes where the wife gets into the husband's phone. Um, you know, <laughs> I've, the, seen, I, I've seen that movie. <laughs> yeah. The proliferation of pornography, which is a, which is a wild one. Um, you've got a situation when, with pornography where it's still, I mean, they say that a third of all pornography, you know, the, fat, the, the most research sites on social media now are, are, are porn and sex sites. They've taken over, you know, the, the vast and majority. It's a trillion Not, dollar business. Oh, it's huge. Sure. It's yeah. huge. And so you've still got, I mean, you've got women, they say maybe a third of the porn site searches and the dating site searches are women, but mainly a lot of this is a guy thing. And it's not really a good guy thing because what you've got is a situation where, you know, <laughs> porn kind of dehumanizes women. I mean, you've got, you know, 16, yeah, not 16, we hope, uh, you know, 20 year old strippers, you know, silicon supplemented females in body suits and, you know, doing all kinds of perverse sexual acts. And then you go home to your, you know, your wife of 20 years, and, you know, it kind of it pales by comparison. And then you've got the erectile dysfunction drugs. I mean, all kinds of stuff you wouldn't think about because the erectile dysfunction drugs are, are allowing guys, even older guys like you and I, suddenly we still think we still ought to be sexy. Meanwhile, the, wives, the, the female biology is, hey, we ought to be slowing this down a little bit. So you got a guy who's not only got an erection, but an instant erection, thanks to Viagra, saying, okay, let's just go right now. Women who used to love foreplay in the mood and setting the, the tone, they're not that interested in that, and they certainly are not that interested in their 75-year-old husband doing that to them immediately. So you've got pornography really kind of having a, a being a real game changer. It changes the what I call the sex expectations of, of the couple. <laughs> so you've got you've got that. You've got the gray divorces, which are you know old silver-haired guys like me getting divorced. I mean, you know, who would think of people getting divorced in their 60s and 70s? But that's the fastest-growing component of divorce in America nowadays. Yeah. So there is a real sociological shift, and I know that's the kind of stuff that interests you on this program. Well, I mean, I'm sure it interests everybody to find this out, because you think about it, and maybe you wonder about it, but uh, talking to you, you know, you have, you have stats on it, at least, uh, you know, experience on it. <clears throat> so going back to the last two things you mentioned, you know, sex has got to be part of a marriage. As sex changes, the marriage changes, right? <clears throat> so as you go forward, um, it changes in so many ways. The institution itself is different because you can have these external sexual influences come in um, and they change the relationship between the parties. Uh, and that's that's not a good thing. Not always it? in a healthy way. I mean, yeah. I've, I've heard sex therapists say, hey, you know, watching porn together can get you both excited and stuff like that. And I'm sure in the minority of cases that can happen. Yeah. But, you know, what you've really got is you've got, you know, you've got guys taking a kind of a warped view of sex Women not seeing the humor in it, you know, when they come, they come into their husband's den and, you know, he's got his computer open, and then he slams it, slams it shut as soon as she walks in the door. I mean, you know, that's, that's destabilizing right there. So you, and then you've got, like I say, the, the, the situation where the expectations change so dramatically. And, you know, guys who, you know, the biology, human biology is designed where both, both genders should be kind of losing interest and losing ability and capability almost all at the same time. Right. But now that's been jacked around by Viagra and, yeah. the, and the ED drugs where yeah. the guys can supposedly keep going. Women are going, hey, can we, shouldn't we be focusing on something else nowadays? You can see how destabilizing that it, is. It you know, destabilizes the whole institution. So Chemistry. Um, go, yeah, yeah. I mean, chemistry, modern chemistry. Not necessarily better Actually, living technology through technology affects everything. That's right, that's right. <laughs> So how does that affect society, though? We talked before about, you know, this, this migration of people to uh, living together instead of being married. Now we're talking about marriages that are affected with uh, external mm, sex, sex considerations. Um, how does that affect society when you have that? Well, there's, you know, that, that obviously has a deleterious effect on society. And the other thing that's happening is that there are just so many more options. 
I mean, it used to be that, you know, you grew up in Nebraska and you, and you had your high school girlfriend and you thought, my God, if I don't marry her, I'm never going to have somebody as great as her in, in my <laughs> life, right? And now, you know, you, you break up with a girlfriend and 10 minutes later you go online and you go on one of these Tinder sites and there's somebody, you know, two, two miles down you know, you, that's really plugged into your GPS and, okay, let's have a meetup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, 10 minutes later you got a new girlfriend. Yeah. So it's, you know, that is a hugely destructive, uh, you know, it's a game changer. I won't say destructive because I guess it liberates. Yeah. The other thing is, that, that, you know, we grew up, I mean, I was talking about the gray divorces. Our generation grew up out of the 60s, you know, where we thought we should just have everything. I mean, you know, we, you know, we wanted to have, you know, free love, free sex. And, you know, you know we, we, we were going to stop the war in Vietnam. There was going to be peace and love and communes and all, you know. It's the expectations of our generation that we've had great post-year economics, post-war economics for 50 years. So our group, our generation grows up expecting that everything ought to just go our way. And that's not really a healthy thing for marriage because, no. you know, I mean, things don't always go your Especially way. Especially now when there are so many problems in the world right. and, and in the and, country. And so many other options. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, another technology, and you mentioned it, and it seems to me it connects with the Viagra. That's one kind of technology. Social media is another. T these are invasive, you know, on, this, on the structure of marriage, on the, the institution of marriage. And so um, my marriage can unravel because of social media. Um, I can meet people online. I didn't stand up. I can meet people. Uh, you know, Sally, and Sally and Harry and all those movies about romance uh, that, that generated out of social media. So my question to you, and you alluded to this earlier, is does it work? Does, do relationships that come out of social media really work? Because everybody can be sort of hypnotized into thinking that they know the other person when, in fact, they know the electronic image of the other person, not the real person. No? Well, I can tell you this. I, you know, it's hard to say exactly how much you know, meetups result in workable stuff versus not. But I can tell you a couple things. One, marriages that come, you know, second marriages that come where somebody meets somebody new in the course of their first marriage, leaves their first spouse to go with somebody else, those have even a higher rate of divorce than first marriages. First marriages, everybody thinks about the 50% of all marriages ending in divorce. It's actually about 45% of first marriages, goes up to about 65% of second marriages, and all the way up to 85% for third marriages. Wow. So the idea of you know, the guy taking off with his secretary, leaving his wife, and then you know, because she's younger and sexier, that's going to turn everything around, that's a misnomer. It actually, the, the chances of those kind of relationships working is, is, are actually minimal. I mean, it, it can happen, and they say that sex, for example, is better in second marriages, but you know, to have everything else co you know, come together in the second marriage maybe is a little tougher. Well, in the third marriage, you mentioned the sh chances of it working are even less. Now, could it be that it's a personality filter? In other words, you know, you're the kind of guy that likes to move on all the time. And so uh, when you move on, you're really saying, I'm not willing to be committed. And marriage to me is a, an interim arrangement. Yeah. Well, it's a total a personality filter is exactly right. There's some that I alluded to this earlier. There are now meetup sites and, and hookup sites that are targeted for just people in a certain socioeconomic group. I mean, it's, it's gone beyond the just, you know, we'll More get out there and try groups. and have a date. Yeah, you know, there's Christians, there's farmers, there's all, you know, you know, let's meet one another. And what happens is that it's self-selecting. Now you get high earners meeting only other high earners. It used to be a, you know, a lawyer boss in a law firm might meet his secretary, and if she was cute and bubbly, even though she had a high school education, you know, you know that'll be my second wife. Now, your second wife, or your, even your first wife, is somebody that's from the same socioeconomic group that you're in, and, they, and doctors and lawyers marry one another instead of marrying, their, like I say, the nurses or the secretary. So it's actually causing s social stratification between the haves and the have-nots in society. So that's a, that's a factor. There's, there's all kinds of unintended consequences. Yeah. I mean, you know, technology is, is, we're unleashing all kinds of stuff. And you also mentioned the, the gray, the boom in what you call a gray divorce. It's very interesting. You know, there is a relationship, isn't there, between gray divorce and gray sex. Um, oh, probably. But, yeah, I mean, the, the, the kind of process we've been describing for an, an undefined generation, maybe an earlier generation, to a later generation, the same processes exist uh, with, the, with, the, with the technology, with the, you know, either the body chemistry technology. Um, or the pure chemistry technology. Yeah, the or Viagra social, technology. social media technology. <laughs> yep. All of those things are brought, are brought forward into your gray years and then you have gray divorce. 
Well, and, and it gets worse. I mean, I, I would, you know, I, the great divorce is, is so relatively new that I haven't got My Divorce with Decency book has a lot of statistics in it. Statistics are not really coming together on great divorces as to the causes. The effects are quite, the, quite there. Like I say, it's the fastest rising component of divorce, divorce in society. So interesting. So, you know, one is the, you know, the me generation, you know, we're used to having it all. And when, you know, and we all think, you know, I mean, I'm 67. I mean, this is a time where I would be theoretically thinking about, you know, who was going to change my diapers and, you know, my dentures and, you know, and just be. You, you know, do just, have a way of putting And things. just be happy, just be happy to, you know, to have somebody that could, you know, to have a mate that could take care of you. Instead of, oh, my God, now I can take Viagra and I can have sex for another do 20 years. And I, I always wanted I've been doing do. everything I wanted all the rest of my life, so why should I stop now? You know, that, Take a flyer, yeah. Uh, the, the last point I wanted to get to is something we just talked about briefly in the first part of the show, and that is, um, you know, the law is changing. And as, as a social our world of social mores, social connections changes, so must uh, matrimonial law. And I know we, we have a minute to discuss a huge body of law, but I wonder if you could comment on that. Where are we going here in Hawaii and maybe nationally, maybe globally, in terms of the way the law intercedes in a marriage that's having trouble? Well, there's a few changes that are, that are happening. One, alimony used to be a common, common thread and component of, of divorces. Uh, now in Hawaii, we have alimony in less than 9% of all cases. Nationwide, it's less than 15% because, you know, the, the Wahinis are working a lot of the time. So, this, you know, those days of, you know, alimony for life, that, that's, that's definitely changed. Joint custody, which we alluded to earlier, there's definitely a push for that. Um, child support is, is, you know, used to be a negotiated idea, you know, a negotiated element of a divorce. Now there's automatic guidelines based strictly on gross monthly incomes and it's automatically deducted from your, from your paycheck. So that's gotten more dr draconian about its enforcement. Um, there, are, there are definitely, there are, you know, so, you know, obviously you've got, you know, now you've got uh, uh, same-sex marriage, which, is, which has the same, uh, as the same law applies to same sex as to, as to heterosexual marriage. So, so a few of these things have been introduced that are, that are literally changing matrimonial law per se. Um, and then there's the issue of, like I say, the, uh, the, the, the changes in society, which are, which are really complex and, and much more far-reaching. Mm. So if, um, if camera one was a judge out there and uh, you bring a certain amount of wisdom and experience, uh, and he's a new judge or she, um, what's your advice as to the appropriate mindset for a judge to have to deal with all these changes in our, in our society? Well. You got to have you got to have an open mind, and that's getting harder and harder to do. Um, there's a you know there's a there's a real, like I say, there's there's socioeconomic gaps, there's gender gaps. I just wrote a piece on on the the, the widening gender gap between between men and women, which is which is kind of a shame, and it's going to get harder and harder to bridge. Um, you know you get you get. Uh, you know, regardless of what you think about President Trump, you know, you, you know, in, with his, you know, uh, reputation for something resembling misogyny, uh, you know, that's, that's divisive. I mean, I know a lot of women that just absolutely, ha you know, hate his whole, you know, his whole program uh, and literally, uh, you know, would hate their husbands for watching Fox News and be voting for them. So, I mean, there are, there are, there's a tendency to, to, to become much more tribal in society. And judges, of course, have got to rise above that. Judges have really got to try and understand yeah. everybody. Yeah, and, it, it only occurs to me now, Brad, but I've got to ask you one question, you know? With the Me Too movement and women, you know, making complaints against men for various levels and, and experiences uh, in sexual misconduct, that has to affect the courtship process, don't you think? That I think a lot of people would be a little afraid these days, hearing about all of that, and wondering if what they do now, which they think is a legitimate, um, you know, uh, maneuver in courtship, um, turns out to be a mistake, and turns out to get them in trouble when they want to go to the Supreme Court. Uh, am I right to think that courtship um, has changed also? Uh, totally, totally. I, you know, I think we'd all better shred our high school yearbooks. Um, you know, realistically, it used to be that there were well-defined roles between men and female. A guy would call up a gal in advance, ask her out on a date, get a corsage, pick her up, you know, you know, meet her parents, you know, take her home at a, at a reasonable hour, and you know, and, you know, make sure. It, there, all of that has, has totally changed nowadays. Nowadays, a guy sends a text to a to a gal that he's just met and says. 
me and my buddies are going to be at Joe's bar, you know, at eight o'clock night. Why don't you and a few of your gal friends come on down and we'll hook up? And that's that's courtship. Uh, you know, I mean, it's the whole the whole methodology of that has totally gone out the window where a guy was supposed to, to, to be the initiator and try to be chivalrous about it. And now it's gone even further than that. Now, if you get a guy who calls a gal and she says, sorry, I can't, you know, I can't come this Saturday. I can't go out with you this Saturday night. So he calls her back the second Saturday night. And the next thing you know, she says, he's harassing me. He's called me twice. I mean, that, was, you know, that used to be what a guy was supposed to do. Right. <laughs> now, now he's a harasser. Right. So, it changes the, the whole scene. It changes uh, how you can conduct yourself. And the stakes are much higher now. They're much higher. And everything, thanks to your tech and everything's in the cloud, everything that you've ever done in your life is, is there to, for everybody to find out. So, you, you know, it haunts you for the rest of your life. Thank you, Brad. Brad Coates, Coates and Fry, divorce lawyer. A decent divorce lawyer. Decent divorce lawyer. A, a, a lawyer of decency. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Jay. And he was a quiet child. <laughs>